Now, if you are looking to take planetary or lunar images, what steps can you use to take your observations to the next level? Having enjoyed observing Mars last autumn, Jupiter is finally returning to our northern skies this year, closely followed by distant Saturn and its beautiful ring system. So whether you are looking through a telescope or imaging with a camera, here are five tips to help you with your planetary observations. Now remember, the Moon is the equivalent of a very close rocky planet, so this will also work with peering into lunar craters as well. Now, first step is I recommend spending the time to collimate your telescope. This isn't a collimation video and refractor owners can smile smugly, but a poorly collimated telescope will never show clean images. Now, before we dive into the details, just a quick recap of the principles behind capturing high resolution shots of the moon and planets. The planets are quite small in terms of angular size, much smaller than the moon, for example. So because they are small, we need a high magnification. But here is the problem and it's the atmosphere. It's so important to life, but so harmful to the night sky. And in addition to seemingly perpetual cloud cover, the atmosphere introduces turbulence to the images, a process known as seeing. Now we get nights of good seeing, where the features can be seen, and nights of poor seeing, where it's like looking through a swimming pool. So if we are taking high magnification views to maximize our chance of capturing fine details, then we need nights of good seeing, where the atmosphere is not limiting what's on view. So the best way to achieve that is to observe the planets when they are high in the sky, ideally on the meridian or an hour or so either side. Here they're above the worst of the turbulence and the crud that's low down on the horizon. And you can find the best time to do this on the free software tool Stellarium or my preferred planetarium software Sky Safari. Both work really well. Now the next tip is to check the jet stream forecast. There are plenty of websites. This is one that's come up on my search. Now the jet stream is a channel of high velocity winds in the upper atmosphere, typically bring poor seeing. So I use the nights of poor seeing when the jet stream is overhead as a practice nights to go through my setup and capture process, a dress rehearsal for nights of good seeing. And you never know, the forecast might actually be wrong and the seeing might actually be quite good. In addition to the seeing in the atmosphere, we can also have turbulence in the telescope tube as well, a process known as tube currents. Now you won't get good results if you bring a telescope outside from a nice warm house into a cold winter's night. There'll be heat haze coming off the lenses and the mirrors dis that disrupt all that fine detail. So allow your telescope to cool to ambient an hour or so before you observe, put it in the garage, put it in the garden. Leave the dust covers on in case of any bird deposits or dew and give the telescope time to reach ambient. So another bonus tip, a telescope, particularly a black telescope like my Celestron, can radiate heat away to the cold of the upper atmosphere and overcool. This introduces cold air currents which descend down the tube and again disrupt that image. So a layer of heat wrap silver foil will make a big difference in keeping your telescope at the ambient air temperature as the night goes on. I'm lucky enough to observe over nearby fields and trees, but when I'm shooting low down Jupiter, I have to relocate to the front of the house where I'm now shooting over rooftops and chimneys. Now here, the scene could be quite poor. The roofs are radiating heat back into the cold night and there's warm air venting from chimneys and boiler vents. So a bonus tip, if you can, a more rural location can provide steadier seeing than rooftops, car parks, tarmac. And another bonus tip, your laptop and your body heat are actually another source of warm rising air. So make sure you and your computer are away from the open end of the telescope. With planetary cameras, we're typically shooting at around F15 or F20. And at these magnifications, focusing the telescope introduces all kinds of vibrations. It's not easy to find that accurate focus when the scope is jumping all over the place every time you touch the focus wheel. Now, a motorised focuser makes such a difference. I couldn't imagine going back to a manual focus now. I've just fitted a Skywatcher auto focuser. This runs off a nine volt battery, but I fitted a 12 to nine volt converter to mine, so I can use the same power supply as my mount. Now, as the air temperature drops, the metal of the tube will contract, and again, that changes the focus point. And secondly, in this designer telescope, in the schmidt cassegrain the primary set, the primary mirror is not fixed. We need to check our focus periodically as the mirror settles. So I might check my focus every 15 minutes or so. Now, the atmosphere also introduces false color to a bright planet. This is where the atmosphere behaves like a prism 
and gives one limb a blue tinge and the other a red tinge. Now this device is an atmospheric dispersion corrector, an ADC, and it has two counter-rotating prisms that counteract the atmospheric dispersion effect. There are a number of these on the market. This is made by ZWO and it works really well. Here is an image of Mercury I shot when it was only 10 degrees above the horizon and it looks like a spectrum. If I put the ADC in the, in the imaging train, not only does it make it possible to observe planets at low altitude, it also cleans up the red-blue fringing and produces a much cleaner image. You can use the red-blue align tool in Registax as a free alternative, but in my experience, you do get a much better result with an ADC. Now, while we we're talking about useful bits of kit, this is a flip mirror. This is worth its weight in gold. Again, not too expensive. And this device allows us to get the planetary disk onto the small camera chip. First centre the planet in the relatively wide field of view of an eyepiece and then lift the lever. This lifts the mirror out of the way, flips the mirror out of the way and allows the light to reach the camera. Again, I can't imagine setting up to observe the planets without using a flip mirror. So there you have it, a whole heap of tips to help you observe and image the moon and planets. I hope that's been useful and as always please subscribe and I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky.